Welcome to Real Wealth, Real Health, the show that empowers you with insights, information, and inspiration to achieve your version of financial wellness. Learn how to balance living a full life today with planning for the future. This podcast is brought to you by Alpha Investing, a real estate-centric private capital network that provides exclusive investment opportunities to its members. And now, here are your hosts, Ada Pia Dorico and Daniel Coca. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Real Wealth, Real Health. Today, our episode is a little different than our regular conversations with investors and entrepreneurs. Today, we are sharing a recorded event that the Principles of Alpha Investing hosted for our investor network on April 28th of 2022. You already know me, and you know Daniel. Today, you'll also hear from Fark Tari and Ann Lin, our partners and the other principals at Alpha Investing. Fark is the CEO and founder, and Ann Lin is our head of underwriting. The prevalent themes of the episode are centered around the current macroeconomic environment with rising rates and inflation top of mind, How our firm positioned itself during COVID with an overview of our multifamily senior housing and single family rental portfolios, and how we're looking forward to the types of assets, markets, and strategies that will make sense in a changed economic environment. In this recording, we both broadly and specifically address the questions and topics that are top of mind, both for Alpha and for our investors. We hope you'll enjoy hearing from our leadership team. Before we can look toward the future, let's take stock of where we are today and what has brought us here. It's always helpful to know where one is and where one is going by knowing where we've come from. And some of you who know me (laughs) know how I feel about personal reflection. And um, it's not only a good personal exercise, but also an important business exercise as well. So I'll start with this. Two years ago on April 6th, we sent a communication to our network outlining our thoughts and our strategy as the pandemic took hold. So at that time, we communicated that our patient and disciplined approach offered us the stability and the flexibility to never have to present a deal that didn't make sense. And then just as now, that philosophy for Alpha hasn't changed. In that letter, we said, and I do quote, you will not see any new investments from us until we feel that we have enough clarity on the current environment to invest your capital confidently and responsibly. So in other words, we put a pause on any new investment opportunities until we felt we had enough clarity on the new environment to confidently and responsibly invest capital on on behalf of our investors. That was April. Then on May 29th, we sent another communication and basically said we were doing a lot of deal review, a lot of underwriting, but there was still too much uncertainty to bring anything forward to our network. So in other words, we didn't have any deals to show. In that particular market environment, we were mainly focused on identifying investments that we reasonably believed had high durable cash flow and could absorb at least a 25% economic vacancy, which is very high. But those times warranted that that degree of downside protection. So that was May 29th. And then as the months carried forward, we really focused on our portfolio and on our asset management. And then the the markets began to move again. In July, we presented a deal and on July 27th, and again, this is still 2020, we closed a capital raise for an affordable housing transaction in Chicago, where 70% of the in-place rents were paid by government housing. The response from our investor network was very strong. And that really told us that our investors had an appetite for new investment opportunities, as long as the risk was appropriately considered. And those risks were both economic and health risks. Since that raise in July of 2020, and up until 
until our most recently closed transaction, which is Tides on 61st in Phoenix, we presented and raised capital for 23 deals. So 15 multifamily, three single family rental portfolios, two senior housing, two funds, Alpha Fund 1, Alpha Fund 2, and a short-term fixed income vehicle. And so we'll be the first to say that we did not expect the flurry of activity, the rapid and the sharp rise in property values, or the consistent double digit rent growth in many markets, not at first, but this was all to our benefit, both on the acquisitions side, as well as when we sold properties. And we have returned some exceptional IRRs to our investors over the past two years on our realized transactions. However, despite this like somewhat dizzying activity, we've maintained very conservative underwriting and we've always been focused on downside protection, value creation, and predominantly all of this in strong growth markets and all of this while seeking out reliable risk-adjusted returns and opportunities. So with all that said, let's talk about our portfolio. So I'm going to turn this over to Anne, so a VP of underwriting, head of underwriting. So Anne, given that many, many of our questions that we received today were related to our current portfolio, could you talk about the underwriting considerations that we've made over the past two years, how the portfolio is positioned, and what investors can expect from these assets? Sure, yeah. So thanks for the overview, Adapia. And so... Uh, you alluded to this a little bit in your intro, but I wanted to kind of fill in a little bit more detail. So as we looked at the last two years since COVID, we see three distinct phases. As mentioned, the first was one of immense uncertainty at the onset of COVID. And the second was the emergence of winners and losers with respect to asset types and geographies as we adjusted to a kind of pandemic environment. And then the third and current phase is where many Americans have kind of reverted or are reverting to lifestyles pre-pandemic, but are facing challenges of rising costs of everything from food to housing and transportation. I'm going to focus on the first two phases as Farc will speak to the current phase later on. And so, as mentioned, at the start of uh, COVID, there was a lot of uncertainty. And at that time, we focused on staying on top of the kind of macro and micro economic changes and actively managing our portfolio. Through our hands-on asset management, we were able to see changes in occupancy, rent, and collections in real time. And one thing we observed on the acquisition front was that there was little to no COVID distress sales pricing, even if NOI income was impaired because of a large amount of assistance and forbearance. And so instead of selling at a lower price because NOI was depressed, owners chose to hold and wait out the downturn while NOI could recover. And so while we didn't present any transactions in the first half of 2020, we were actively evaluating opportunities and narrowing our investment target. Considering the increased risk environment, we sought a targeted strategy that emphasized in-place cash flow and upside potential. The in-place cash flow allowed the investments to withstand negative shocks, such as decreases in rent and economic occupancy. And by targeting investments where value could be added to improve cash flow, that provided upside potential that was not tied uh, kind of to market performance. We saw the most compelling opportunities in housing, multifamily and single family rentals, because housing is need-based and the overall supply and demand fundamentals are favorable. Generally, as mentioned, we look for investments that could withstand the 25% economic vacancy. And we also actively sought affordable housing opportunities where a significant portion of that rent is subsidized and paid for through government entities, which reduces uh, collection risk. And so all this focus was on risk mitigation because we just were not sure what kind of fundamentals were. At the end, our specific investments fortunately did not experience the 25% economic vacancy that some other markets and asset types uh, did. We took comfort in knowing that the investments could have absorbed that negative shock. And so that brings us to kind of the phase two investing environment which was that the pandemic rather quickly created winners and losers between asset types and geographies. Retail, hospitality, office, and senior housing struggled with fundamental demand. While multifamily and industrial exhibited strong performance, within multifamily, performance was uneven across different markets with the 
Sunbelt kind of states outperforming while the gateway cities underperformed. And so as capital flocked to winners, including multifamily and high growth markets, this concentration of capital for limited investment opportunities drove pricing up and yields down. Nationwide, multifamily cap rates decreased 1% from the mid 5% range in the middle of 2020 to mid 4% range at the end of 2021. This is a rather steep decline in a short period of time. That movement in cap rate means that a property you purchased in the middle of 2020 would cost 20 to 25% more a year and a half later at the end of 2021, um, not factoring in rank growth. And so building on the knowledge that we gained and kind of managing through 2020, we, we were able to kind of tailor and adjust our investment strategy. While COVID was still a concern, overall the U.S. was in recovery. And throughout the year, we saw cap rates continuing to compress. Well, we, we believe fundamentals in certain markets supported that pricing appreciation. We had concerns that if uh, the price increase, if the price kept increasing due to competing capital versus asset fundamentals, there would be increased risk to the downside. And so we therefore felt an urgency to find attractive opportunities that had downside protection relative to upside potential while the window kind of remained open. And in 2021, we identified 13 opportunities that we believed had the attractive risk adjusted returns that we shared with our network. And so considering the compressed cap rate environment nationwide and that COVID was still impacting operations through eviction moratoriums and restrictions on certain fees, we targeted high, high growth markets as we saw resilience and upside potential and believe that those more than outweighed the risk of the lower cap rates for those markets. And I'll touch quickly on the two other asset types, single family rentals and senior housing that we've done recently. We made the deliberate decision to enter single, the single family rental space in three markets this past year. This was another sector that we believed had attractive uh, returns relative to the downside risk. Uh, the acquisition yields are approximately 7%, which is higher than multifamily, even though the fundamentals are similar. We intentionally acquired the initial properties without debt. And while this limited the number of properties we could acquire, the unlevered portfolio allowed time to execute the renovation and lease up. And so to date, we have acquired 175 properties across the three markets. And the portfolio has started to generate cash flow as more properties are renovated and leased. And so now we're in the process of introducing debt to grow the portfolio now that there is sustainable cash flow from the existing portfolio, existing uh, investments to service the debt. And so the, finally, the senior housing sector has faced challenges throughout COVID. The residents are amongst the highest risk for adverse outcomes stemming from the virus, and the operating margins are low and easily eroded from declining vacancy and rising operating costs. It's unfortunately also taking longer for the sector to recover from the negative effects from COVID-19. And so our senior housing operating partners have actively been managing our portfolio, pushing vaccination campaigns, sanitation efforts, as well as trimming costs where possible without affecting service. Over the last two years, we've seen performance kind of ebb and flow. And so while the sector faces more challenges compared to multifamily, we believe that the long-term fundamentals are still sound and positive and are cautiously optimistic that there are signs of more sustained improvement. Before we move on to, to FART, because you're going to be kind of digging in a little bit more, there's a really good question. And the question is why we underwrite cap rate expansion. And the question is framed of whether we think that cap rate expansion is likely to occur, but I know that, that, that we have a different way of thinking about it, which is part of our conservative underwriting. So, you know, maybe, Anne, did, did you want to just touch quickly on why we underwrite it that way? Sure. And I know, I think Fark is going to address this a little in his oh, okay. as well, but ultimately it cap rates, it, it is un, an unknown versus something like, so the two components of uh, return are income and kind of appreciation. The income, as we mentioned, going through the Tides case study is something that we can see sponsors kind of ability to affect and execute. The cap rate compression or expansion that affects 
either the degree of appreciation of, of assets or maybe even decreasing in value. And why we underwrite cap rate expansion kind of academically is because the returns that investors make is on the spread between um, cap rates and debt. And so as debt, the expected rate of financing is expected to rise, again, kind of academically, you would expect that cap rates would rise as well to kind of maintain that spread. We have not seen that in the most recent cycle. Rates increased from, we were in a rising rate environment right before COVID and from 2016, 17 to 19, and cap rates com continue to compress. And so by underwriting the expansion, I, there, there are definitely different schools. Certain people think that cap rates will continue to compress because of the amount of capital out there. We are admitting that we don't know, I guess to a certain extent we're subscribing to the academic theory that that spread sh should be maintained. But most of all, it's, it's, it's providing a degree of downside protection. And so as going through the case studies for, for the two tide sales, that Cap, the fact that cap rates did not expand and they compressed instead, that was upside to our investments. So if cap rates do expand, it, as is what all our uh, underwriting projects, then investments still have an attractive risk-adjusted return. Thank you. So let's move on. Fark, we've been teeing you up <laughs> for your section here. So I'm going to turn it over to Fark and he's going to talk a little bit more about how here at Alpha, we're thinking about the current market environment, how that's informing our decisions. So obviously we had a lot of questions about interest rates and inflation, also about the sustainability of rent growth, as Anne mentioned in some markets, i.e. Phoenix there has been a 30% rent growth. And just the other day, I heard an economist say that the most bullish they were on Phoenix was 10% rent growth. So I think this kind of goes without saying, we say this a lot, nobody knows, we don't know, but we can certainly track. And with our underwriting, as Anne said uh, many times, we're just very much focused on the downside and not overly bullish in the way that we present deals and returns. So Fark, I will let you take it away here and talk about the current market environment and what's going on there. Absolutely. So, you know, as you've already referenced, a lot of the questions were related to rising interest rates, rent growth and affordability. We've talked about cap rates, inflation, the possibility of a recession. So these are a lot of different topics and there's, there's a lot to consider within any given one of those topics. So I'm going to have to make a few generalizations here. I'm really only going to be able to scratch the surface. But I do want to do my best to try to offer our investors more insight into how we are thinking about these topics. So I'll start with the rise in interest rates and cap rates. Anne's already alluded to this, but you know, over the past 18 or so months, we've kind of really moved into this highly compressed cap rate environment, certainly we're seeing, particularly within multifamily cap rates at historical lows. And so you know, the difference between today versus, say, 2016, 17, 18 when we were in a rising rate environment is that at that point in time, there was still a positive spread between you know, where cap rates were and where interest rates are. Whereas right now, when you're looking at deals, oftentimes you know, in the low to mid three caps, if, you're, you know, if you have floating rate debt, particularly where it's tied to an index as Anne referenced, and you know, we expect to see rates go up you know, one to 200 plus basis points you know, through the end of this year, and that creates a scenario where you have a pretty significant negative spread actually on your interest rate relative to your going in cap rate. So what that does create that didn't maybe exist as much in the past is this really acute risk of not being able to maintain debt service. And again, that's, that risk is more acute for, for the floating rate debt that's going to continue to increase as, you know, so for a library increases. And again, given the expectation that the Fed fund rate is going to go to 300 basis points by next summer, you know, you're going to see significant rate increases on floating rate debt. Even on fixed rate debt, of course, you can lock in a rate of closing, but, you know, locking in, say, a 3.5% rate six months ago compared to maybe a 4.5% rate today, that does still create a, a higher risk of not being able to maintain debt service if there's any kind of degradation to income. 
So I think the bottom line here is that it is really important to be clear about and acknowledge the fact that as we continue to move through this rise in interest rate environment, the risk of not being able to maintain debt service is a real one. Anne's already alluded to this, but of course we believe our portfolio is equipped to manage that risk and absorb that risk. A large component of what we've done over the past 18 months has really relied on floating rate debt. There's a trade-off between you know, using floating rate debt so you have the flexibility to exit earlier versus taking on some of that interest rate risk if a SOFA or a LIBOR does increase. And so maybe some investors may be concerned about the deals in our portfolio that have that type of exposure. But I think as Anne touched on, our recent focus really has been on markets that are experiencing very strong growth, both in terms of market rent growth and renovation premiums. And so Dallas, Las Vegas, and Phoenix, you know, these are markets we've heavily focused on over the past 18 months. And as Anne referenced earlier, these markets are seeing, you know, 30% to upwards of 75% rent growth on renovated units. And of course, that captures both um, organic rent growth and market rent growth, as well as the renovation premium. With that said, that does lead to another important question we received from numerous investors, which is whether such rent growth is sustainable. So from a macro standpoint, we all know we've seen very significant rent growth during the past two years of the pandemic. I think there are a lot of different factors that are driving that. Two obvious ones, for example, are just kind of the increased money supply and then the continued shortage of housing units. I would say that in general, we don't think such rate growth is sustainable at a macro level. And in fact, we do believe there is an increase in affordability crisis. That's itself a much deeper conversation. But we also know that rent growth is going to manifest itself differently from one market to another. So, for example, if you look backwards from into the prior decade from 2010 to 2019, the average rent growth nationally during the, for rental units during that time frame was about 36%. However, there are a number of markets that experienced outsized rent growth that was well in excess of the national average during that period. So, Oakland, California, for example, in the Bay Area, rents went up 108% during the prior decade compared to the 36% national average. So this is a long way of saying that we know not all markets are going to perform the same way. And so as we consider where we are today, although we don't believe the recent macro rent growth is sustainable, we do believe there are certain trends, you know, particularly migration patterns that may cause some markets such as Las Vegas and Phoenix to continue to experience elevated levels of rent growth. And if that rent growth persists, then that may create, you know, opportunities to still, you know, really significantly achieve strong increases in NOI in such, in such markets. With all of that said, I think it's really important for our investors to very clearly understand that when we underwrite transactions, we're not counting on such outsized market rent growth persisting. So when we're looking at a property, we do look at loss to lease, and that's just an indication of, you know, where the properties in place rents are relative to the current market rents. And we do assume that over the course of the first year of ownership, the properties, you know, rents that are below market can be brought to the market rate. Then when we're looking at the renovated units, we are underwriting renovation premiums based on, you know, a comp analysis that allows us to identify properties that are renovated to, you know, similar scopes and effectively underwrite premiums that we believe can be achieved based on what we're actually seeing in the market today. And so this is a long way of saying that we are doing our best um, at the onset to underwrite rents, both unrenovated and renovated units that are actually being achieved today. And then thereafter, we tend to underwrite anywhere between three and four and a half percent annual rent growth during our investment horizon. And so that's much more in line with kind of the historical norms. So, so, you know, bottom line here is that we're not relying on such outsized rent growth to persist in order for our transactions to work. If it does in fact persist, then that creates more upside potential. I think circling back to rising rates, of course, another common question we've received and Anne alluded to this as well is, you know, as interest rates go up, wouldn't we expect to see a commensurate increase in cap rates? And you know, the, the honest answer is we don't know, and I, I don't want to I don't want to belabor that point, but I think that it's really important to acknowledge that there are different factors at play here. So if we exist in a vacuum, for example, and interest rates went up, 
then one would expect that, of course, if the cost of borrowing goes up, then there would be fewer individuals willing to pay that higher cost of borrowing. And that would lead to, you know, sellers having to lower their pricing expectations, i.e. cap rates expanding. But the reality is we don't exist in a vacuum. There are many other factors at play. And I think one of the most obvious additional factors is the, the sheer quantity of capital that exists today. So as we all know, the economy was flooded with capital in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, and the overall M2 money supply has increased nearly $6 trillion from March 2020 through March 2022. So that represents a 40% increase effectively, and that's the largest two-year increase on record. So there are a lot of investors and economists that believe that just due to the sheer quantity of capital chasing deal, cap rates will remain low despite the impact of rising rates. And if you just want to do a quick math problem, for example, if you know our interest rate goes to five or five and a half percent, that's the um, that's the cost to service the debt. But if you're using say seventy percent leverage, let's say at five percent, then your the necessary yield to service that debt is three and a half percent. So are there going to be buyers that are willing to buy properties knowing that there's going to be no cash flow to the equity, but they can barely service their debt? Or are there going to be buyers that are willing to buy properties and raise interest rate reserves to prepay uh, the cost of debt since the property can't maintain the debt service on its own? That may in fact be the case, again, due to the sheer quantity of capital chasing deals. So we don't know the answer to whether cap rates are going to expand or not. But I think from our perspective, the more important consideration is, can our portfolio absorb the impact of rising cap rates? And from our perspective, the answer is yes. And that's because our general approach to underwriting is to underwrite significant cap rate expansion. If that expansion does in fact occur, then we're covered because it's what we assume to begin with. And if it doesn't occur, then it just leads to, you know, outsized return potential to our investors. So, you know, bottom line is we can't answer the question definitively, but we've put ourselves in a position to where we believe we'll be covered either way. We've also received a lot of questions about whether we're expecting a near-term recession. And while I don't want to sound like a broken record, there isn't a simple yes or no answer to this question either, because once again, there are a lot of different variables at play right now. So let's talk briefly about inflation. It's reached highs we haven't seen in decades, but of course we know there are multiple causes of inflation. So again, the unprecedented increase in the money supply during the past couple of years has clearly driven inflation. But we also know there are supply chain disruptions, labor, food shortages, increased energy prices, and various other factors. Some factors everyone agrees on, some there's disagreement on, so you know that's a different conversation. But clearly inflation is as high as it's been in several decades, everyone agrees on that. The Federal Reserve has now signaled that it's going to take a more aggressive approach to reining in inflation, which of course means, you know, a more aggressive approach to hiking rates. But we know that there are several factors that, uh, that impact inflation that are in fact outside of the control of the Federal Reserve. So it, it's not clear how aggressive they're going to have to get in terms of pushing rates up to get inflation under control. And it's also not entirely clear which elements of inflation may in fact persist, even if the Federal Reserve is aggressive in hiking rates. And of course, as rates increase, we would generally expect to see a slowdown in growth. And if that slowdown, if that slowdown in growth occurs while we simultaneously see high inflation persist, then that's going to continue to create affordability challenges and exacerbate those challenges for many Americans who may be forced to alter their consumption. And of course, lower consumption in a consumer-driven economy is going to create more downward pressure on growth. So there certainly are a number of factors we can you know, observe and look at that may lead one to the conclusion that a recession is on the horizon, and a lot of people have that belief right now. But there are also other factors we have to consider. So we see strength in the current labor market. You know, There's record personal savings. Currently, there's still strong consumer spending. And so such factors may lead one to, to the conclusion that the economy can absorb the impact of, uh, of rising rates and there isn't a recession that's impending. I think that's certainly the view of the Federal Reserve right now. That's what that's the view they've echoed at least. But of course, we know the Federal Reserve, you know, had a very different view on inflation over the past year than what's actually happened. So nobody knows if they're right or wrong. Ultimately, from our perspective, it's all about positioning ourselves to where we believe our downside is covered, regardless of, of you know, what happens. So to conclude my thoughts here, I do want to be pretty clear on a couple of things. 
So first of all, and I'm sure this message has already come across pretty clearly, but Alpha Investing is not a firm that's going to try to time the market. We're not a firm that's going to try to tell people we can predict the future because we just know that there are too many variables at play to, to be able to do so in any degree of confidence. We also know that, frankly, there are some really smart people who are really polar opposite ends of the spectrum in terms of telling, telling others what they think is going to happen. So there isn't really a very clear consensus. We, of course, have our views, but in general, we believe that we want to just take an approach that allows us to mitigate risk. And I will acknowledge, and I think we've acknowledged this, that we absolutely perceive there to be increased risk in the current environment, given kind of the various factors, various factors we're discussing right now. And because our investment philosophy is focused on risk mitigation, any investment we make, we're going to look for strong upside potential relative to risk we're taking. But first and foremost, we look for downside protection and we want to make sure we can preserve capital. So in an environment where we are seeing increased risk, our response is going to be to pull back a little bit and assess the ways we can better manage risk, which is the point we've effectively come to right now. We think there are a number of different ways to do this. So for example, this may mean placing more emphasis on long-term fixed rate debt. That, that was a much larger segment of our portfolio prior to the pandemic. Again, in the past 18 to 24 months, we've relied more on floating rate debt. But if we go back a couple of years, we were much more heavily focused on long-term fixed rate debt. And maybe returning to that approach is an important consideration. We may consider using less leverage. Um, we could consider allocating a greater percentage of capital to higher yielding asset classes like single family rentals, or maybe looking for higher yielding multifamily assets in smaller, you know, stable or slightly growing tertiary markets. So there are a number of different ways to, you know, try to better manage risk. We're assessing, you know, these various options and others. And we absolutely expect to continue presenting new investment opportunities to the network in the future. But I do think we have to acknowledge that relative to how busy we've been over the past two years, which frankly came as a surprise to us, things are going to slow down a bit for us over the next couple of quarters as we just take some time to assess and determine the best way to continue to manage and mitigate the risk that we see. With that said, we're also not a company that is forced to deploy capital. You know, we're not seeking to continue to wrap up for the sake of doing so. So taking a step back, assessing and just maintaining a prudent and disciplined approach and maybe subsequently seeing a slowdown in capital origination for us is more important than, you know, continuing to be aggressive for the sole purpose of deploying capital. So with all of that said, ultimately what we want our investors to understand is that we're going to remain patient, we're going to remain disciplined, we're going to look for opportunities that we believe make sense on a risk-adjusted basis. That likely will lead to a slowdown in, in new opportunities as we kind of think forward over the next couple of quarters, but we're going to continue to do the best we can to assess risk and present opportunities that we believe uh, provide attractive risk-adjusted returns. Thanks for that, Fark. And I know if anyone has any questions, just pop them into the, into the Q&A. When you were speaking about like such polarizing information out there, it reminded me of, of that email that I forwarded. I got an email from some economic newsletter subscription and on one, on the top, it said, recession, basically it was like the recession is coming. And then the next article underneath it said, there is no recession, everyone's wrong. And so like, this is like inside of a business kind of journal newsletter coming through. And, and, and I saw it again today on, on something else about, we don't invest in office, but it was about office. Like, oh, you know, office is not coming back. And then the other article next down the line was like, oh, office is really strong. So it's kind of funny, but it's also really confusing. And so I think that just really speaks to what you were saying about so much information to digest such a, an unusual point in time with decisions and how the Fed punted on inflation for such a long time. And, and now they have to be more aggressive. And the point of all that is to say, nobody knows. And so we're just trying really hard to, to say like, we're always doing our best and we're always taking all of this information into what never changes, which is how conservative we are with our underwriting. And so if anyone has any other questions about some of the stuff that Fark just touched on, you can pop them into the, the Q and A and, you know, we're kind of coming close to the end of our time. So I will turn it over to Dan. And if you have questions, we can take those at the end. And so Dan's going to talk a little bit about what we're looking for in the future. And also, as we stated previously, a little bit more about SFR. Awesome. So 
one of the questions we got was what asset classes do you see the greatest opportunity in going forward? And so personally, I smashed my crystal ball when my 20% over ask bid for a house in Nashville, you know, put us in third place, right? And so the, the story now is, you know, really sticking to these kind of three major food groups that we like with some variation, really everything that, that Fark was talking about, right? We've always been need-based residential investors and Econ 101 tells you that, you know, when there is more demand than there is, people need a place to live. It's true in a good economy. It's true in a bad economy. It's true in whatever economy that we're, we're in today. And I think we want to, you know, be in a, a position where, you know, residential assets can stand the test of time. We, we saw that through COVID. It was proven to be true. Now, you know, these assets, particularly like the value add multifamily assets, the class B, right, where in good times, people move from C to B in bad times, they move from A to B, there's always someone in B, like that had very much proven to, to be true during during COVID. But in this environment where we have the combination of rapidly rising interest rates and compressing cap rates, it becomes very really challenging for those types of deals to, to pencil on a risk adjusted basis, even though there may be a lot of demand from people to live in those types of, of assets, right? And so that's really something that, you know, we've been trying to wrap our head around and it goes to the points that, that FARC was, was just kind of making, right? It wasn't all that long ago that, you know, people were on pause thinking about 5% cap rates and 4% interest rates. And, you know, now we're in this environment where in like a Phoenix, you could be looking at a sub 3% cap rate with, you know, floating rate debt that'll creep, you know, above 5%, you know, in, in the not too distant future. Those types of deal profiles, as Fark mentioned, they look a lot different, right? You might have to raise an, an interest rate reserve. You might be in a position where there will be nominal cash flow, you know, during the, the early years of, of the project. And you're really making a bet on the residual value of that asset at sale. And you know, the risk profile of those types of deals just looks very different. And so some of the ways that you, know, you think about continuing to deploy capital in multifamily residential assets outside of that box would be looking at core or core plus deals, maybe something with a, a light value add component. Like as Fark mentioned, you know, these secondary stable tertiary markets you know, people live 45 minutes outside of Cincinnati, right? And they, they need housing. And those are areas where there's a little bit less competition. We have to spend a bit more time getting comfortable in those markets. It's not as easy to say, I'm comfortable with a Franklin, Ohio in the same way I would be, you know, a Phoenix or, or a Las Vegas, right? But that's part of the, the kind of job that, that we have here, here to do, right? And so we will still look at, and potentially invest in these workforce value-add multifamily deals in, in these markets like Phoenix, Vegas, Dallas, Fort Worth. Now, they're gonna most likely have to be true off-market deals. They're gonna have to be reasonable cap rates and whatever's happening with, with the debt, it's gonna have to you know, actually be accretive to the deal and, and make sense, right? As Fark mentioned, and, and really we've all said, we're, we're not gonna push things forward for the sake of pushing them forward. It's one of the benefits of having a relatively small team. I think we're about to hire our eighth or ninth, you know, kind of full-time person to the, to the team right now. And, you know, that allows us to take a beat and, and be patient as we think about originating new investments. We want to be in a position where when opportunity strikes, you know, we have our investor network and the capital ready, ready to deploy, right? And so that takes me into the single family rental space. And, you know, you've probably heard me or someone on the team talk about this ad nauseum, you know, over, over the last six months or so, but the data in that asset class is just very compelling, right? Pre COVID about 1% of single family rentals were owned by private equity, right? Even though single family rentals make up the largest percentage of the rental stock in the United States, right? With multifamily being the, the, the in second place. Now, through this point of COVID, 
three, three and a half percent of those assets are owned by uh, private equity or operating partner. You know, they believe we could hit 20 to 30 percent private equity ownership in the next, you know, five years. Is that a number we're banking on? No. But one thing we do know somewhat definitively is that capital chases yield. And in our single family strategy, we have 12 percent gross rental yield. That's kind of our, our what we'd like to hit on a, on a going in basis. And we don't look at single family homes, individual single asset purchases on a cap rate basis, really. But if we did, and we kind of held our operational margins held, held true as they are now, you know, we're looking at seven and a half cap acquisitions, right? And so these are assets that are capable of producing a meaningful amount of cash. Now, in those vehicles, we are taking that cash during the early years and we're buying more homes because we believe that there is a shrinking window. Institutional interest in single family is only going to continue to grow, particularly as yields in multifamily and other asset classes continue to, to compress. So we talked about before, we're looking to build a one to 2,000 property portfolio, stabilize it, and then sell it to a private equity firm, a REIT, what have you. And so one of the questions we have here, which is one I've gotten a few times, this one's from, from Jim, is really about the, the backlash, investor backlash, or really society's backlash against you know, private equity buying all of these single family homes. And in effect, you know, continuing to drive up the prices and, and making it less affordable for, for individuals, right? And so, you know, I think we first off have to acknowledge like there is an affordability issue as it relates to housing, particularly when you're looking at, you know, sub $200,000 housing, right? And then as mortgage rates, the uh, ability for a lot of these, you know, blue and gray collar workers to have the money to make a down payment and feel comfortable with their mortgage payments, that, that's dwindling, right? Now, every, every other week, we have a hour or so long conversation with the principals at JKB and their team. And we talk pretty in depth about everything we're seeing and questions we have. And so just this past week, we did actually have the conversation around are you seeing any backlash? Are there issues? And you know what they're telling us is no. Like demand is, you know, from investor demand is continuing to increase. There is a ton of investor interest in these assets because the additional yield that you see in single family rentals, that is something that allows you to absorb interest rate increases, right? And in a world where we do head into to some type of recession, you know, it's a characteristic of the SFR asset class that we find pr particularly compelling. Senior housing, as we all know, operationally intensive, 20, 30 employees or more at these facilities, nurses, cooks, uh, program coordinators, what have you. COVID has been a disaster for this space, you know, for the obvious reasons, right? But if you need me to say, I'm, you know, cost of employment of materials, regulatory compliance, health issues all went up. And simultaneously, you had occupancy dips, whether it was from, you know, people dying from COVID or people being afraid to, you know, go into these facilities for fear that, you know, they would get COVID and, and then ultimately die, right? And so if we had this conversation a year ago, I would have told you with a lot of confidence that I expected the next 12 months, the past 12 months, to have a ton of you know, senior housing acquisition opportunities. The environment was right. All these mom and pops like really needed to uh, get out of the asset class. It's very hard for a non-institutional manager to weather the, the ups and downs of how COVID has impacted senior housing. And I was completely wrong. We've only seen really one interesting deal, the Mosaic portfolio, which recently closed. It was a four property senior housing portfolio in, in Oregon. And we acquired that actually at close to a 10 cap, right? So when you're acquiring a deal at a 10 cap and you know, this deal will, will likely put HUD dead on very shortly. You know, you're looking at really strong uh, cash flow right out of the gate, and that's always going to be uh, appealing to us, right? We're looking at another portfolio right now very early, so I, I really shouldn't comment too, too much on it. But I think the, the sentiment here is that we may start to see some amount of distressed or near distressed pricing, whether 
uh, that is for stabilized assets or not, you know, remains to be seen. I think we're less interested in acquiring properties that have a lot of lease up risk. Uh, a stabilized asset is, is a lot more interesting to us on a risk profile basis. In, in this present moment in, in time, no one can control you know, how COVID may evolve and ultimately impact that, that space. But when you can acquire deals at relatively high cap rates, and you know we have an operating partner that has has really has a great track record you know managing these assets particularly through covid where i think across the portfolio their occupancy was about 5 percentage points above the the national average you know we we've been looking for more opportunities in this space again to the extent that that they ultimately make sense We hope that you have received valuable insight into Alpha's position, our philosophy, and our strategy. We believe that there are good opportunities in the market, and we will continue to pursue those like single-family rental portfolios, senior housing, and stabilized multifamily in strong, steady, and sustainably growing markets. If there's one thing we understand, it's that we cannot predict with any degree of certainty what will happen in the future. We can say, however, with certainty, that we're committed to doing our best for you and all of our investors, no matter the market conditions. We remain committed to our underwriting and our focus on protecting the downside, which has never wavered and will never change. Thank you and take care. Thanks for tuning in to Real Wealth, Real Health. We hope that you've enjoyed today's episode and found it both informative and insightful. We welcome all your questions and your feedback about today's episode and especially We welcome your questions about specific topics that you would like us to cover. So shoot us an email at podcast at alphai.com. And if you have a moment, we really appreciate ratings and reviews as it helps us grow our online community and our interactions with you. And we'll also be linking to a number of relevant articles on topics that we might have touched on during our conversations. Some of them are broad, some of them are technical, but we're always aiming to provide information that helps you better understand the mechanics of building this healthy financial foundation, especially if you're looking to do this with real estate. 